All right, let's open our Bibles this evening to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. And encourage you guys to come to the breakfast. The church is buying breakfast for everyone on this first men's breakfast, so you should take advantage of it. Come hungry and bring someone with you. Tonight it is our intention to begin a what I think is going to be a 42-week worth of study through this final book of the Bible, which with vacation and holidays and all, might very well take us through the year. But what a book it is to start a new year with. The, the, the final word from the Lord about you and I, the world, and his plans, and the completeness or the fulfillment of everything that he has promised to do. This is the final disclosure of Jesus Christ. It is the final revelation of God to you about his plans for you, what he is planning to do, and what he has promised. It is an, an important book. You should understand it well. And especially living in the last days, as I think that we are, Jesus ends this book by saying to John, Surely I am coming quickly. And I know if you hear that, you say to yourself, mm, Not quick enough. But John said, Even so, Come, Lord Jesus. And really, that's where we're at tonight. There are several themes to this final manuscript. There is the sovereignty of God, because in the end, he is the one who is over all. His word will be the final word. There will be no other word than his. The worship of God is found that everyone joins in, not today, but then. His angels, all of mankind, his enemies, in fact, all of creation will bow down before him at the arrival of God's kingdom upon the earth. There is the fulfillment of literally hundreds of Old Testament prophecies found in this book. And the sequence of events are important to learn. The glory of the church age, the rapture of the church, the 70th week of Daniel, or those seven years of tribulation that is coming to try men's hearts the return of Christ with his saints to rule and to reign, the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ, the new heavens and the new earth. You should know this book well because it'll help explain literally chapters and chapters in the Bible. Without this reference, you'll, you'll be left hanging through the prophets, through the symbols, through the analogies. You really won't know where to turn. But this will open up for you the scriptures. Through it all, the focus remains just upon one person, upon Jesus. Really, nothing else matters to this book but his glory and his name and his rule. It is the only book that comes with a built-in promise, and you're going to be blessed to have him come tonight. I know you want to get into all the action, so I'm only going to do three verses. <laughs> but hang in there. Better you have a good foundation to get started than we just run ahead and dive in. We trust that you're going to be here with us each week. We know the, who wrote the book, John the Apostle did, because he tells that to us three times in this first chapter. In verse 1, in verse 4, in verse 9 as well. He mentions himself again several times in chapters 21 and 22. No doubt about that. It, it is the Apostles John's fifth book in the New Testament. He wrote the gospel that bears his name. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John towards the end of your Bible. <clears throat> By the way, all of them <clears throat> written to third generation Christians. By the time John begins to write, the early church is gone. The second generation is for the most part gone. And a third generation who was not there as eyewitnesses or even there as, as first generation people who heard from those who were there are much alive anymore. And then he writes this book. And this young man, now an old man, who referred to himself often as the one whom Jesus loved, was chosen by the Lord to reveal these final things to us. He's the only apostle that was not martyred for his faith. He outlived them all, though they tried to kill him. History tells us that they pulled him in hot boiling oil. And he survived. 
The Lord was with him. So he writes this document. He is probably 95 or 96 years old when he writes it. And it was probably written about 95 or 96 A.D. So towards the end of the first century, everyone else, certainly all the other apostles are long gone, and John is still around. When was it written? Well, the first major persecution against the church arose from Rome during the reign of Nero. Nero reigned from 54 to 68 A.D. Until then, or before then, there were local skirmishes with the church. A lot of it came from the Jews. Rome kind of stood by and watched. If they got involved at all, it was under the kind of encouragement of the religious communities. But when Nero came to power, he was threatened by the church, and literally thousands upon thousands of Christians were put to death by this man's regime, including Peter and Paul. They both were taken out by Nero. The next wave of persecution came under the reign of, of Emperor uh, Titus Flavius Domitian. He came to power in 81 AD, would rule for 15 years through 96 AD. And it is he who uh, really turned up the heat against the church. In fact, his words were he wanted to ethnically just cleanse the world of the church. And, and he murdered many upon the earth. He demanded public worship as God. He slaughtered in the most atrocious ways those who wouldn't believe him or follow him. If you ever had a chance to look at the reference book called Fox's Book of Marger, Martyrs, there are plenty of historical references to the, this man's rule. It, it is he who, in just a four-month time, killed 40,000 believers. Most of them, others, were jailed or exiled. <clears throat> it was he who took John, though, an old man, and he placed him out on the island of Patmos, chapter 1, verse 9. A, room, a Roman penal colony 32 miles off the coast of today, Ephesus. Um, Ephesus area is called Kusadasi today. We took our group for a couple years ago on the footsteps of Paul and visited uh, Ephesus, as well as Patmos. Um, it is in the Aegean Sea. Uh, the, the city of Ephesus is called Selnek today. It is in the Izmir province of Turkey. It was called Anatolia for a long time, if you read any kind of a, an old history. But John was taken there in his 90s, just left there to die. This is the way you just get rid of people. And he was influential. He was a pastor of the church in Ephesus at the time. And so they exiled him in hoping that he would starve and die. And he did neither. Instead, God isolated him so that he might bring this word that we have before us to him. Like I said, you can still visit Patmos today. It's an interesting place. It was once very isolated. It now has become a religious retreat of sorts run completely by the Catholic Church. In fact, when we did our services in the little chapel in Patmos, the fellow running the place, Gerard will tell you, brought out the vestments of a priest to me and said, here you go, Father, you can wear these. I said, yeah, I'm not one of those guys. <laughs> and he's never put it away then, you know. But we still had a good service there. Um, the island, I think, does uh, you know explain why John so often uses the word sea, S-E-A, 26 different times. He, he mentions it or uses a, a comparison. I suspect that's all he saw was the sea around him. John was left there until Domitian died in 96 AD. He was replaced by a fellow called Emperor Nerva, who was <clears throat> at least a little bit more sympathetic for a while to the church. John was brought back to the mainland. He went back to pastoring the Ephesian church. By then the book was finished and John spent the last few years of his life pastoring the church there. He was buried there in Ephesus. One of his disciples named Polycarp, if you had any church history for yourself, <clears throat> took over the pastorate for John at that point. So um, this was written about that time at the end of the first century. There are many folks <clears throat> who approach the book of Revelation with great hesitation. 
There are plenty of churches that will not teach it at all, or they'll just stay away from it altogether. They'll claim that it cannot be misunderstood. Isn't it interesting? A book called The Revelation of Jesus, they go, yeah, I don't, I don't get it. They say it's too difficult to, imper- uh, to interpret. Sometimes it's just a mystery, and you know they are put off by the, the symbolic nature of it or the fulfillment of the scriptures and just being able to put them together. I should tell you, I don't think it's the hardest book in the Bible. I think there are more difficult theological books than this book. Does that mean we have all the answers? We don't. And I'll be happy to run into, when I run into stuff and go, you know, I, I can't make an argument for this at all. And I'll be happy to, t- to refer you to people who can. Uh, I won't agree with them, but you can go read them for yourself. <clears throat> Here's my intention. I have no intention of interpreting this book for you. But rather, if we study God's word, then we should allow the Bible to interpret itself. And I think that the symbolism you find here, the, the uh, allusions that you find here, the illustrations that you find here, are all in common usage by the Lord over centuries of time. So if you want a biblical definition for a symbolism, you can usually find it in the scriptures. In fact, over half of this book's symbolic nature is defined in the text itself. So you don't have to be confused. If someone says to you, what are those seven stars that Jesus holds in his hand? Just keep reading. He'll tell you what they are. Or what are these seven spirits of God? Just keep reading. God will define them for you. So you don't have to like scratch your head and go, I wonder what that means. No, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to tell. Interpretation without the rest of the scriptures is extremely subjective and absolutely misleading. You don't want me to get up here and tell you what I think it means without a scriptural basis for that. For example, if I said to you, Mary had a little lamb, we might very well begin to interpret that in a hundred different ways. How did Mary get a little lamb? And how did she train him to follow her wherever she went? Well, you get the picture. We can't just arbitrarily go running after these things and just decide that this is what it means. And and you would be surprised at how many books you will read that, does, that, that do just that. You'll say, well, where did you get that? And they'll, like, they're the authority. I'm not an authority. I only know the Bible and that God wants me to know his son. So I'm going to use the Bible and, and, and try to help you to come to biblical conclusions based on the evidence that we have. And that's all I know to do. In reality, the very fact that this book is called Revelation would tell us God intends to make things clearer, not muddier. <laughs> not cloudier. The word itself means to, to take something that is hidden and to make it known. The idea that we would have 65 books of the Bible that say, come and know the Lord, draw near to him. And then he ends the book with saying, <laughs> see if you can find me now, is ridiculous. Not God's heart, not God's intention, certainly not God's way. That's inconsistent. He doesn't want you to arrive at book 66 and say, oh, this is too mysterious. God has thrown me a curveball. Good luck finding me. Jesus began in Matthew 13 with the crowds using parables. He he defined them for us there. He said that, in fact, when he was questioned by the disciples there in Matthew, you know, why are you talking to us in these stories, in these parables? Jesus answered and he said, For you it has been given to know the things of the kingdom, but to them it has not been given. So whoever has, to him even more shall be given to them. But he who does not have, even that which he has will be taken away. And the Lord went on to explain that very thing, that, that God used illustrations, parables, stories, stories that were physical in nature so that you could cross the divide to the spiritual and have understanding of the spiritual truth. He used parables to help the believers clearly see what he meant. But there were also people in the crowd that didn't want to believe him. And so the parables did something else. It hid the truth from those that were unbelievers. So they wouldn't end up more comfortable to the Lord than they already were. So Jesus used storytelling to highlight, to help us understand um, spiritual truths that we wouldn't otherwise have a basis for understanding. But he also used them to hide the truth from those who who don't want to hear anything from him. So even that what they have, it, it becomes, if you will, taken away from them. 
Jesus, Mark says, it says in chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus began to speak to the multitude in parables, and without a parable, he didn't speak to them. So at some point, he just kind of hid all of the truth from the unbeliever so he wouldn't find himself more guilty, but he used them always to illustrate truth to the disciples that he loved. So to those who are hungry and seeking and want to know the Lord more closely and with greater clarity, you'll find the answers here. If you're a life of hard-heartedness towards the Lord and you really don't believe much about him, don't seek to walk with him, you might find great confusion here. You might pull your hair out and go, oh my goodness, where am I going with all of this? But, but that has always been God's way. To know his word only requires that you are born again, filled with the spirit and seeking his face. Paul said to the Corinthians, spiritual things are spiritually understood or discerned. Jeremiah wrote in chapter 29, verse 13, the Lord saying to the people, you shall seek for me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. So I fully expect you to learn more of Jesus by going through this book. I expect you to get closer to him as a result of coming. This book is given to God's people to reveal Jesus and his plans for you and I, for the church, for Israel, for the earth, and beyond. But it isn't, it isn't brain, you know, surgery. It really is down at the bone level or down at the, the ground floor. It's, it's, it's consumable. It's reachable. It's, it's approachable. I think it was J. Vernon McGee who used to say, God is interested in feeding us as sheep. We're not giraffes. And then he said, so just teach the Bible simply. You'll get all that God intends for you to have. And certainly God's spirit, I think, prefers that over the academics of those with, and there's a lot of books written on the book of Revelation by people that aren't even saved. You can find them everywhere. Everyone's got an opinion. But the greatest concern that, that you should have if you're not a Christian isn't what Jesus writes here, but it was what he said in John 3, that if you don't have him, you don't have life. And if you don't believe in him, you're condemned already. Forget about revolution. Get right with Jesus first. And once you do that, he can certainly lead you through this book. Like any other book in the Bible, approaching God's word requires faith. Hebrews chapter 11 mentions that to us very clearly, that, that without faith it is impossible to please him. If, if we come to God, we must believe that he is, that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, I think like every other book of the Bible, you've got to pray for wisdom. God, speak to me. God, open my mind. Help me to understand what you're, what you're wanting me to learn. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, I think verse 60, 68, Lord, open my eyes to the wonderful things out of your law. Teach me. He wrote a hundred verses later, let my cry come to your Lord, uh, let my cry come to your, and give me understanding to know your word. So pray that prayer. I mean, God help us to understand what he's wanting to teach us. And then I think there has to be a willingness to search the scriptures. And I hope that'll be your commitment. You know, you should have a reason for the hope that lies within you. You should have answers for why you believe what you do. And I think this book will certainly provide those for you. The Berean Christians, according to Luke, were more noble even than those in Thessalonica. They receive the word with all readiness of mind, and then they search the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. Paul would write to Timothy, his, his uh, young pastor, who, by the way, was the pastor of Ephesus before John. But he would write in First uh, Timothy 2, verse 15 to him, be diligent and, and be approved as a worker of God who doesn't need to be ashamed, shamed, and rightfully divide the word of truth. So you're going to have to kind of put your, you know, your head to the, to the grindstone, so to speak, and, and get to work. This book focuses on Jesus. When John, in chapter 19, falls at the feet of an angel to worship, <laughs> he is told to get up. I'm a fellow servant as you are, but this is the testimony of Jesus, so worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, or if you will, prophecy points to Christ. And really, this is the book. If you walk away from this book without talking about Jesus, you've missed the main emphasis. He's the author of the book. He's the subject of it. 
Don't become distracted with other things around you that draw you away from that fact personally. Because that's what, you, you got to walk away from this book saying, Jesus is amazing. Can't wait to, to stand before him. We wait for Jesus to come. We look for him in this book and in our lives and in the clouds. We will find him no longer in this book as a man acquainted with grief. He now comes as he truly is. In fact, this is the only book that presents Jesus as he is today. Full of glory, coming soon. Ready to gather you together. There are hundreds of, hundreds, that's maybe an exaggeration. There are many uh, models of interpretation. If you begin to read books about the book of Revelation that you will encounter, I think only one is biblical. But there are many others that are presented. And usually when you learn what someone's methodology is for study, the Bible as a whole, this book in particular, you also learn right away about where they're coming from. One of the most uh, well-embraced uh, models is called the preterist view. Preterists believe that all that is written in this book was fulfilled in the past. And because of that, that either it is the overthrow of Jerusalem in 70 AD, or it is the fall of the Roman Empire in the East in 476 AD that you can find in these pages. It is, it is artfully written, I believe it is a very heretical view, but it is received and embraced in even a lot of Bible schools. It steals away from you, the true believer, the hope of Jesus' is coming. It removes the imminence of his return. You don't have to look for Jesus because this has all been taken care of already. That isn't your hope. It is dangerous because it denies predictive prophecy. By that I mean that God in prophecy proves that he is God. It removes the final book of the Bible where everything is fulfilled that is yet to be fulfilled. It leaves everything kind of hanging. It denies a global judgment. It denies the reality of Jesus' biblical bodily return to the earth. It sets aside God's promises of a new heaven and a new earth. And it steals from you the hopefulness that God wants you to have, as John would write. It, you know, we, we don't see him yet, but when we see him, we're going to be, he's going to, we're going to see him as he is, and we're going to be like him. And if you have this hope, you're going to purify your life. So the preterist fruit kind of writes this off as non being non kind of prophetic at all. And like I said, it's widely accepted to this day. There are those who take the position that revelation of Jesus is a has a historical view, and and the historical view of looking at this book basically says that most of the events of Christian history from John's time to the second coming of Jesus have already been lived out. In fact, Genesis, sorry, Revelation chapter 2, verse 19, are indicative of experience of the church through the ages. And they will leave it up to you to determine what portion of the historical view is applied to those chapters that are explained. And when the history doesn't match, then they begin to make imagination and invention to fill in the blanks. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventists believe in a historical view. You might remember David Koresh from Waco. That was his position on this book as well. It was developed very late in the game, about the 12th or 13th century. It came out of the fight against the papacy. And so they began to try to discredit the papacy through their historical view. This view turns exegesis, the proper interpretation of the Bible text by context, into kind of an artful play of ingenuity. They, they make things up as you go. You'll, you'll read the historical view and go, where did you get that? And just shut up and keep reading. I'm the, a, a scholar. You're not. And it's not very popular today, to, to be honest with you, but it is still out there. There are some who hold that the book of Revelation is just idealism or symbolic in nature, which declares it's just a volume of, of allegories, that this is not intended by the Lord for you to take it seriously or, or even literally. It is a bunch of spiritual truth that shouldn't be taken literally. They are broad statements from God about the perennial struggles between good and evil. 
They set aside every future aspect of the book. They tie everything to history. And they kind of make it a devotion where they pass it along to succeeding generation to say, well, you know, look, we learned this. Now you should learn it as well. So they, again, make things up as they go. There's really only one model that works biblically, and that is this is a de declaration of God about the future, or if you will, call it the futuristic model of biblical interpretation. It sees this book as uh, prophetic. It sees this book as unfulfilled. It sees that this book needs to be taken literally. What is written down should be literally received unless... There is an indication in the text itself to do otherwise. If you start running around uh, metaphors or similes, words like as or like, well, all right, those are, those are illustrations. But until you have those kind of um, indicators, we, the, the approach of the scriptures should always be the same. We believe God means what he says, says what he means, now, you probably know people who, if, they, if you say hello, or if they say hello to you, you wonder what they mean. But that's not the Lord. He, he means what he says. He wants you to know him. And go into this book with this understanding. God wants you to know him better. He doesn't want to hide from you. If he wanted to hide from you, that would have been easy. You wouldn't have known him. But he wants you to, to, to know him. The, the golden rule of interpretation is when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense and take it as primary and ordinary and usual and literal unless the facts of the immediate, con uh, of the immediate context uh, would indicate otherwise. So you just stick with what it says until you are told otherwise. Easy enough. And that's what we should do with every scripture. God desires you know him. And in this book, you will come to the, to the last things that God has, gonna, has fulfilled or is going to fulfill. Genesis begins the revelation of God and man. This book brings it to a close. The, uh, Genesis and Revelation are the bookends, if you will, of God's uh, story. It is futuristic. It is prophetic. It is understandable in light of the context of the scriptures. There are 404 verses in this book. There are 300 Old Testament scriptures. So... Without this book, much of the Old Testament references are going to lose their significance and remain unfulfilled. You're going to read chapters in Hosea and Isaiah and Jeremiah, and you're going to go, where are they going to go? And you go, I don't know. When is this going to happen? I don't know. Will this ever take place? I don't know. If you take all those other models, you can just go, I don't know. I don't think it'll ever take place. You can start crossing chapters out of your Bible. But they are fulfilled. Without this book of Revelation, we would have the beginning of sin in Genesis without the end of sin. We would have the fall of man without his full redemption. We would have a Savior who rose and ascended, but never came back as he's promised. We would have a church left behind forever with promises they could not rely upon. If this book isn't for real, your faith is in vain. Yet God has given this to us to reveal the things to come. It is the ultimate end result of man's sin, the end result of the world system, the end result of false religion, the end result of the devil and his ways, the end of this heaven and this earth. It is the final things that will result for every man in eternity, whether glory or judgment. It's the end of things. The outline of this entire book is concisely, concisely stated in one verse. You can look at verse 19. Won't get there this week <laughs> or next. Or the, no, the third week, so we'll probably get there. It says this, Re Write the things, John, which you have seen, that would be the vision of Jesus as described pri prior to those verses, and then write the things which are, present tense, which you will find in chapters 2 and 3. The things that are is the church age and the letters that the Lord will write to those churches that were in existence at the time. And then thirdly, and then I want you to write which the things which will take place after this. What? After what? After the age of the church. In fact, in chapter 4, verse 1, you will read the words, after these things. 
the Greek words are metatauta. After this, after what? After these, this church age. John writes what he had seen presently, the, the age of the church, and then beginning in chapter 4 through chapter 22, the things which shall be. And I really believe that after 42 weeks of study together, you'll have a concrete, solid handle on the book, and you'll be, you'll be blessed to know what God wants to do. So let's get our feet wet tonight. I know we're almost done here. Verse 1. Verse 1 says this, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must take place or must shortly take place. And he sent and he signified it by his angel to his servant John. As we said, this word apocalypsis, a revelation means to unveil or to disclose or to take off the wraps. Contrary to saying this is some hidden mysterious book, God declares by the pen of John that this letter is designed to reveal, to take off the wraps more fully of his son. And John is given this re revelation by Jesus himself so that he can take and show us, the servants, the things that must shortly take place. Already that's a pretty good exciting start, I think. Here's what God wants to do. 700 years before Jesus came upon the scene, the prophet Daniel was ministering, and the Lord in chapter 12 said to Daniel, Daniel, I want you to shut up the words that I have spoken to you and put them in a book until the end. Many will run to and fro. Knowledge will increase. And I said, the, Daniel said, I, I didn't understand. When will these things be? And the Lord said, Daniel, put the words away, close up the book, seal them. They'll be understood literally at the time of the end. So 700 years before, Daniel is given all kinds of prophecies about the, the coming of the Lord, and we're going to look at those as we go through the book. And then he's, he's told, put them away. And Daniel goes, I don't get them. Yeah, you're not supposed to get them. Not for you, it's for later. Put them away. And then you come to this book, Revelation chapter 22, verse 10. And the Lord said to John, don't seal up the book, this book of prophecy. The time is here. The time is at hand. Lay it out there. Let everyone see what's coming. Thus the change from the Lord's heart, from Daniel until these final days, the, the last days, as, as Hebrews calls, that time that comes and starts with the coming of the Lord. We are in the last days. Throughout the scriptures, we are given various revelations of Jesus. In the Old Testament prophecies, you get lots of pictures of the Lord. In the, altar, in, in, in the offerings that are made, um, in, that, in that term, the angel of the Lord, you've probably run into that, right? In the Old Testament, when Jesus kind of shows himself before he is incarnated uh, to the Old Testament, we, we meet a Lord that is willing to su uh, suffer and die for the sins of the world, will one day come to rule and to reign in the Gospels. His first coming has him, you know, his glory shielded in, in human flesh, but one day he's going to come unglued <laughs> and unshielded, and he's going to come again his glory being revealed. He's not going to come as a lamb that was slain. He's going to come as the king of kings, as the Lord of lords. No doubt in, or, or no longer, I should say, in his humiliation. you got to get the phone, really. It's like the sixth ring. You get, <laughs> or seventh. So we're going to come to know the Lord who, who, who now comes to rule. And it is at that end of the, the book of Revelation that, has, that, that, that all is given to us, to see Jesus in the future tense, to know that every man who's ever lived, that our relationship to Jesus will either leave you with Jesus as your Lord or leave you as Jesus your judge. If you don't know him personally, that is what I would be concerned about. For it is God's will that you know his Son. So, if you want to know the first key to understanding this book, uh, here's the ver first verse, and, and it's the will of God that Jesus is revealed to you. It, it is the, literally the, the, the testimony of the entire Bible, right? Jesus said in John, I think, 539, you search the scriptures in them, you think you have life, but they speak about me, right? These religious guys, they were all, you know, they could quote verses, but they had no relationship with God. And Jesus said, you think in them you have eternal life, but they talk and they testify and they point to me. 
It is especially true here in the end, especially in these end times. If we lose sight of that truth, it is easy to become sidetracked. I, I'm amazed when people ask about Revelation, the things that they want to know. And it usually has nothing to do with Jesus. They want to talk about all the ancillary things, and we'll cover them as we go because they're important to be here. But, but you should understand that this book is only interested in you knowing him better. So what kind of titles do you find of the Lord in this book? Chapter 1, verse 5, he's the faithful witness. He's the firstborn from the dead. He's the ruler over the kings of the earth. Verse 8 says he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is who was and who, who is, who was and who is to come. He is the Almighty in verse 8 of chapter 1. He is the first and the last. He is the Son of Man. He is the one who lives. He holds the seven stars in his right hand. He walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He has a two-edged sword in his hand, chapter 2, verse 12. He's called the Son of God in chapter 2, verse 18. He has eyes like flames of fire, his feet like fine brass. He has the seven spirits of God. He is holy, we are told in chapter 3, verse 7. He is true. He has the keys of David. He opens and no one shuts. He shuts and no one opens. He's the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, the lion of the tribe of jo Judah, the root of David, the lamb, the Lord God Almighty, the king of the saints, the word of God, the bright and morning star. He's the Lord Jesus. Go through, make a list, the names that he picks, so that you might know him better. And isn't he the one that you really want to know? He's the focus, he's the centerpiece, he's the message, he's the glory. You'll find him ruling and reigning and victorious and powerful. And let's face it, he's been waiting for this to come and make you know him. This is what he's been waiting for. In chapter 1 and 2 and 3, it's Jesus, the priest, and the king. In chapter 4 and 5, it is Jesus, the Lamb of God, reigning from his throne. In chapter 6 through 19, it is Jesus, the judge over all of the earth. And then in chapter 20 and 21, it is Jesus, the bridegroom, and reigning Lord of lords and King of kings. The revolution, revolution, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants, these things which must shortly take place place, which God gave to Jesus to give to his servants. Not only is this the revelation of Jesus Christ, but it is the revelation to Jesus Christ and to us through him. Remember when Jesus emptied himself, right, and he became fully man, and he lived by the power of, of the Holy Spirit. When the disciples asked him about those days, he said in Mark 13, I think, verse 32, of that day, no one knows either the day or the hour, or even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. Now, that would be hard for you if you didn't know that Jesus was true God and true man, and that when he was here, he emptied himself of the privileges that he, he owned. He, did, he didn't keep, if you will, that, that relationship as Son of God in, in terms of power. He becomes our example, so we have to live like he lived by the power of God's Spirit, by the power of God's Word. We have to rely upon Him and Jesus as fully man. And like we, we don't know the day or the hour. And so He clearly said that. I don't know the day or the hour. In, in Acts chapter 1, right before He has ascended into heaven, will you, Lord, at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which His Father has put into His own authority. So, while he was with us, Jesus was in the same place we are. He had emptied himself. We don't know either the day or the time, but we're to be ready as we know the times and the seasons. In glory, though, Jesus was given the details. Obviously, he is God, and he is able to set those aside and pick those up. I can't explain that to you. I just know that's the Bible, what the Bible declares. And then he passes them along to his servants. I, Jesus, I think Revelation 22, verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you of these things in the church. I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the bright and morning star. So he knows now. <laughs> 
So it was given to him, and now he gives it to John, who passes it along to us. These things which must surely take place. I want you to notice a couple of words. The word must would guarantee that it will take place. Must. Because the scriptures cannot be broken. If the Lord said this must happen, then you can count on it. This is going to happen. The scriptures cannot be broken. John, where is that, 1035? Is that right? Maybe, I don't know if we wrote that down. I don't know if we wrote that down or not. Um, the words in ginemai in Greek mean um, quickly, but, but not in the sense of uh, like it has to happen right now. It is mostly written in the sense that when something begins, it will quickly be finished. So the words in Ginnamai means when it starts, it doesn't last a long time. Or, or once the process begins, it will be finished. All of these words in this book that speak of the nearness of the Lord, of the soon coming of the Lord, or very soon, or shortly, or quickly, they all denote the, the closeness of time from God's perspective. Remember, a thousand years are to the Lord like a day that's passed. To us, 20 minutes is a long time if we're waiting for lunch. You know, when you get to the end of the book and it says, Behold, I come quickly, again, you are confronted with that. When? And I know for us it seemed like forever, but God has a plan for the church that will be carried out, and the threads of prophecy found throughout the scriptures are pulled together in this book, and it'll make like a quilt, but in short order, he will really carry forward everything that you find here, so that for the most part, except for that millennial reign, when the church gets taken away within seven years, this is all going to be over with, right? And then there's really just stuffed at the end, 20, chapter 19, 20, 21. So much of this book will, will take place in, in record time once it starts, and it might start tonight, who knows, whenever the Lord decides to come. I know when, when we feel we're waiting for the Lord, soon and very soon isn't soon enough, but it'll be soon enough once it starts. Notice that so Jesus sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. Um, the word signified, samino in, in Greek means to, to um, give a sign to or to make something known by, by an indicator. You could almost, instead of signify, call it signify. Signify. Um, when Jesus said to the disciples, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men to myself. And then it says, this he signified, by which death he should die. So being a prophetic book, verse 3, <laughs> and the unveiling of, of, of the soon coming events from the Lord, we would suppose that there would be symbols and signs, and, and, and you are right, there are more signs and symbols in this book than all of the other books put together. Um, a, a form of the word signify, and that's why I guess I'm, I'm stopping on that, it is often used by John in, in the Gospels, one of his favorite words. John, if you know John's Gospel, uh, picked seven miracles of Jesus and built his case that Jesus was God around those seven miracles. He, he, he explains them, he, he surrounds them, he, he, he adds the words, by this that you'll know that I am. You've, you've seen that phrase, right? The I am's of God. There's seven of them in the book of John. Seven arguments, if you will. And they are all used by John as signs to signify. And so John translates this word miracles. He translates the same word signs and wonders as he writes about the proofs found in the work of Jesus that signifies, signifies who he truly was. Lest you worry about how do we sort out the signs, like I said when we started, 50% of, of all of the signs and, and, and symbols in this book are defined for us in the book itself. Literally 38% of the others are found in common usage in the Old Testament. So that puts you to near 90% before we ever even wonder about the other 10%. So we'll, we'll take what the, the Bible clearly defines in the context. We'll go hunting for those examples used by the Lord constantly in the New Te Old Testament so that we're on the right footing and we're not just kind of out there, Mary had a little lamb, right, approach. And we'll stick with what we know, and, and, and I think we'll be just fine in determining what the signs mean. Even the numbers that are used, which are important in this book, 
uh, and their uses are clearly defined for us. And so we'll see what the number seven means, because there's a lot of number sevens in this first chapter. Why, why seven? Why not six? Why not 12? Why are there so many signs? Well, I, I'll give you a couple of reasons why I think, and I'm just giving you my opinions here. Um, number one, certainly as the parables, signs tend to make things clear to those who want to know the Lord. And they tend to hide things from people that don't care. So God is gracious. He doesn't want you to be more guilty of, the, of all that you're already guilty of. Um, sign and, and wonders, I think, convey greater insight and emotions than clear than, than just words. You might read the word dictator and you get one sense of things, but if you read he's a beast <laughs> and he destroys, you go, oh, I get it. That's far more descriptive to me than a, a word is. And God goes out of his way to paint color pictures, not just draw in, in black and white. Um, signs and their applications usually don't change as quickly as words do. Words tend to lose their meaning. I had a fellow one time, well, we used to use the old King James a lot, but there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says that we shouldn't lease. Now, the word lease in the Old Testament, at least in those days, meant to lie. Well, I was leasing a car, and he, he came to rebuke me and showed me this verse. Hey, bro, you're not even supposed to lease. Look, it's right here. And I said, wow, what do you think that meant to David? At least a chariot, you think, or something? I don't know. <laughs> but the word had changed its meaning. It just, it, it doesn't meant the same thing. And yet symbolism doesn't change with, with usage of words. They tend to maintain their longevity. So, you know, if you go to 1 Thessalonians, we, we just went through that about a while back, chapter 4, there's a word prevent. And as we know the word prevent, it, meant, it means to keep back. But if you go to the 16, you know, 1611 King James Version, prevent meant to go before or to go first. Absolutely a different word. So words tend to get lost in cultural exchanges. Uh, signs and wonders oftentimes do not. And I suspect that's why this last book, that it has to maintain itself through generations, is filled with those kind of examples so that we, we don't lose the integrity of what God wants to teach us. So God gives to us these signs and wonders that will, I think, more clearly mark out for us uh, his word, his will. He came to John, notice, by his angel, signified it by his angel. Doesn't tell us who this angel is. My guess is, and again, using the scriptures, that it is Gabriel. He seems to be the post office guy from the heavens. He seems to be good at delivering messages. He went to Daniel in chapter 8 and 9. He went to Zechariah in Luke chapter 1. He went to Mary in Luke chapter 1. He went to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1. He seems to show up a lot of times with information. Um, that's my guess. I don't have any other proof of that other than I have five other places where God sent messages and he sent them through the same angel. And I have no other name of any other angel in the Bible that delivered messages uh, on any kind of regular basis. So uh, extrapolation, <laughs> let the Bible have the last word. John is called by the Lord here a servant uh, to his servant. Notice verse 1, the word servant is the word for doulos. I know that if you've been around for a while, you've heard that word before. The word doulos describes a slave who has the has come to a place in a slavery relationship with an owner where he is allowed to go free. But because he loves the owner and wants to serve him, he chooses now not to leave, but to become a servant of him by choice. It was marked out by having a gold hoop put through his ear. Everyone that saw him real, realized he was someone that had chosen to be a slave for life. It becomes a great word of description for you and I, as far as God's servants, we, we choose to serve the Lord. It is a choice that we make. We, we, we line up with him. Uh, we yield ourselves. A good place to be. If you want to hear from God, it's good to have a hoop through your ear. <laughs> you want God to speak to you. It's a good thing to be his servant. And so God spoke to this very faithful, nearly 100-year-old guy. As with all prophecy, God uses it to provide assurance that he is God. So I mentioned it to you earlier, but if you read Isaiah, I think it's chapter uh, 48, the Lord said to, through Isaiah to the people, before 
even before, even, wait, wait, I'm going to get here. I should memorize these verses. Even, yeah, I couldn't. Wait a minute. Uh, even from the beginning, I have declared it to you. Even before it comes to pass, I have proclaimed it to you. And so he makes the, the, the argument that if, if you want to know if God is true, then, then listen to what he says before it happens. A lot of people can tell you what they think. But if God's always right, if he's 100% right, at some point you have to be convinced, man, maybe he knows what he's talking about. In Isaiah 41, show me the things that will happen hereafter, he says, and then I'll know that you are God's. Show me the things that are coming later, and then I'll know, and then I'll believe when you said Isaiah to the false prophets. So the Lord has always used his word to, to identify uh, who he is. I think in John 14, verse 29, the Lord said to the disciples, and I've told you these things that before they come to pass, so that when they come to pass, you might believe that I am he, that I am he. Over 300 prophecies were fulfilled when Jesus came the first time. There is literally an equal number of prophecies that will be fulfilled when the Lord comes the second time. I, I, I'm not going to argue with you that there's three or five, four or ten in, in either direction, but they're pretty close in terms of what we're waiting on. In Isaiah chapter 44, God challenged the false prophets to do as he had done in, in declaring something before time, uh, it, before it came to pass. And they kind of turned away. And in chapter 45 of, of Isaiah, if you've read it, the Lord calls for a fellow named King Cyrus. He calls him that by name. He calls him that 175 years before he was born. And it was later when he was born that everyone went back and said, well, man, the Lord knew. you got to listen to what Isaiah has to say. So God tells us in great details what is coming to prove yet again that he is God and can be trusted. So the revelation of Jesus, God gave to Jesus to give to his servants about the things which must shortly, must shortly take place. And so he sent and he sent signs and wonders by his angel to his servant John, verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all the things that he saw. John bore witness, the word Mark, uh, uh, martyrio, the word uh, martyr, that's what this word is. It doesn't usually mean to die, although that's the way we use it. It means to bear witness or to testify. He uses that word, I think, three times in this chapter. John is, is here to bear witness. To what? To the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus. By the way, those are the exact same things. Since Jesus is God, this is the word of God from Jesus the Son. And all that John saw and was shown about this John would record. He was a faithful recorder. In fact, the words I saw and I heard are written by John 60 times in 44 separate visions in this book. So John's going to tell you a lot. I saw one of these, I saw one of those. You know, you think he'd lost his mind if it wasn't for the fact that the Lord had come to speak to him. And then finally, verse 3, blessed are or is he who reads those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now we are told in many places of the blessings that come from studying the Bible or, or knowing God's word or believing what he has to say or obeying him. But here's a special blessing expressly promised to those dealing with this book. The testimony, the prophecy of Jesus, the word of God. A blessing, not confusion, but a blessing to know what is here. This is the first, and you can mark them down for yourself, of seven blessed is he declarations in this book. That God says, hey, you are blessed, and then he will add or fill in the blank. Um, declarations of, of interest. Where, and it's interesting that a book so often set aside and ignored by so many have this accompanying promise of blessing. So I said there's six others uh, blessings in the in the book of Revelation, one's in chapter 14, one's in chapter 16, one's in chapter 19, one's in chapter 20, two are in chapter 22. Um, you can find those for yourself if they're not written down. But but here's the deal. Notice in verse 3 that the blessings are dependent. Are, are dependent. 
That's not even a word, is it? Are dependent upon three um, present tense participles. Blessings are promised to those who continue to read, continue to hear, and continue to keep, because that's way, the way that it is written in Greek. So it's, it's a matter of, uh, it's not just reading it or hearing it or keeping myself in it, but it's to continually surround myself with these promises of God, the character of God, the nature of God, the coming of the Lord. It is going to bless your life over and over and over again if you'll stay in that place. And notice what he says, the time is near. The word kairos in, is the word for time here. It is a, a period of time as opposed to aura, which is hour or chronos, which means an exact time. The period when all of these things shall take place is nearby, is close, is almost upon us. And again, it is for, first and foremost in, in God's terms of thinking. In other words, God sees all that is coming as just there, right? It is coming right here. Whatever he's waiting for, however long he is patiently waiting for the, the last fruit, in God's point of view, this, what we're reading, is right here, right? It is near to him. It is near to us. So it should be our hope as well. The furniture that is Bible prophecy is just, you know, he puts it on the stage and the curtain's about to go up. I, I love the book. I'm excited to go through it with you. I don't think you'll be confused. I hope we'll give you the answers that, that you're hoping for to understand. I'll be happy to take on the challenging things that you might be confused about. I'll be happy some Wednesday night to just take questions if that's what you want to do. Um, but I want you to know the book well. And I want you to walk around with your Bible going, I know this book because the Lord's coming. Ask me anything. It would be the best. Amen. Next week, we're going we're gonna to see... Um, Let's see, how far are we going to go? I think we're going to go to verse 8. We're going to really pick up the space. The greetings to the church. And then the third week, we're going to, see, we're going to go through one-third of this book from verse 19. What you have seen as John is going to be given a, a vision of the Son of God, and we're going to call that face-to-face -face with Jesus from verse 9 through verse 20. Those are the first three weeks of introduction. And then we'll start each week for the next seven weeks after that, looking at one letter to the church's and how they apply to us today. So that'll be our next nine weeks. Don't miss it. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight as we start this book of, of, of promise that you give to us. If we would just read it, if we would um, hear it, and then we would keep the things that are written in it, we were going to be blessed more so than we could ever be even imagine being. You've made us such a wonderful promise, Lord, that this book's going to leave a, a lasting impression upon us. We're going to be changed by it. We're going to learn so much. We're going to see Jesus as he is. We're going to view our world around us, which seems to be falling apart by the day, as just a tool in your hands to draw men to yourself. And so, Lord, may you give us a, 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 a mind and a heart and a desire to know all that we can about these last days that we wouldn't get caught up in the discussions or the debates or the, the questions, but that we would just grab a hold of everything we can be sure of so that we would know you, Jesus, more and more and love you all the more and look forward to your coming day in and day out. Speak, Lord. May the church know you better. And in this world in which so many are trying to survive, may we step up and start to serve serving a God that is coming for us soon and very soon. If tonight you don't know Jesus, would you come and pray with one of the pastors after the service? They'll all be lined up in front here. You won't be able to miss them. Just come and, and invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Because what we're going to read in the next few weeks we, without him, would, would I think, would, would put you in a position where you just wondered where you stood. And yet you, you should know tonight that God wants to have a relationship with you. He made you. He knew you were, would fall into sin. But in making you, he committed to receiving you and, 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 and redeeming you by his blood. He was all in from the beginning. Tonight he can give you life if you'll call upon his name.